Okay, so, um, <laughs> Titus, can I ask you? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, uh, I'd like to ask you about um, uh, your teacher, Prakashananda, because I haven't really asked you about that before. What, can I ask you what was so, what, what do you think was kind of unique about him in terms of what he offered or what he was able to give you, would you say? Well, I think that, you know, when I saw Prakashananda for the first time, I, for, I just a whole lot got communicated all at the same time. What the, the main thing was, I felt that this was someone who had somehow crossed over. And quite what that means, I don't know. But um, mm. I just felt that, some, that in every cell of his body, this person had, was in a state of love and surrender. And, and and great power actually, but I, but he wasn't, he, you know, he wasn't really the owner of those things. He, he but they just all came came through him. So yeah. Um, so it was an so it was, it was an extraordinary meeting. It was um, it was a meeting I'd been sort of waiting for. Um, uh, you know, and I, I I always remember as a as a young boy, you know, going to these endless parties, my father's a diplomat, and I, I, I always kind of felt that really who I wanted to meet, and the reason I would turn up for these parties is because I wanted to meet Christ, and I thought maybe he, he would turn up at one of these parties, <laughs> but he never, so, well, he, he didn't, he didn't really, well, he, but in fact he was, he was there, I guess, all the time, you might say that. So it's interesting, so you took, because you, you said a couple of things there, which I find very interesting, and sort of I've been debating a lot about, which is which is what you said was about, like you felt that he somehow you didn't want to use these words, but like embodied this in every cell of his being, mm. yeah, mm. which I find very interesting. So what? Because for me that is important. You, know, you can talk about all this stuff. Kind of so he wasn't really an individual on one level. I suppose I mean, it's a very cliched thing to say about mm. someone like that, but in a way he wasn't. He was sort of someone who just the light shined out of him, and he was in a he was a very he was a very humble man. And um, the um, I mean I I was you know this absolutely. Um, How old were you when you first met well, him? I was in my uh, in my twenties, and I didn't know anything about. I didn't know the difference between my left hand and my right, and I I said something about the fact. And when, when I met him, I, I started to spend time with him. I asked him for initiation. And, um, and I, I said, you know, uh, that I, and he asked me what I wanted, and I said, I want, I want liberation. I had no idea what that meant at mm -hmm. all. It was just like, um, and then he told me to come, and I, I also asked him if he would initiate me. And, um, and he said, come, you know, come, Tomorrow morning, he was actually in, in Ganesh Puri at the time. Yeah. He said, "Come tomorrow morning to my to the place where I'm staying, which was Turi Mandir, which is part of the, part of the Ganesh Puri ashram." And um, so I turned up, and um, and he took one look at me and and um, didn't sort of, and I thought he's going to initiate me, and he actually didn't, mm -hmm. and he just didn't didn't even look in my direction. And I thought, you know, what have I done wrong? I thought he said he was going to initiate me, da 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 da, da. And, um, and again, I was a little sport western brat, sort of wanting something from him. Mm -hmm. And I sort of walked, you know, so I spent the rest of the day thinking, you know, well, what happened there, what happened? Anyway, I, and, and I actually, I asked him, I said, Bobby, you know, are you not going to initiate me? And he said, come back tomorrow. <laughs> so, so, I, so I went back the next, the next morning at five o'clock in, 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 the, in the early morning. And... Um, and again, I was just, you know, I was still in this consciousness of a big Western brat who wanted some, something from him. And he, again, he just wouldn't look, even look at me. Mm -hmm. And so, so finally I started to really think, why is this, you know, what, and I sort of, I kind of got it. I, I suddenly, I sort of understood something. And, and what I understood was that I was coming just full of, of my own, you know, they mm -hmm. always say, you know, with cup half, I, I, I turned up just to, you know, with a, with a cup that was full. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And um, and when I finally kind of realized 
that I was just, you know, the, the way in which I was asking him was so inappropriate, it was so spoiled, it was so, um, it was so full of self, if you like. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, I sort of had this revelation. And, um, and I finally was there the third time I went back and I went, I went to him in a, in a state of mind of humility. And this time he, he said, okay, and he initiated me. So that was, that was, that was the way it was around him. You know, he didn't, it, it, things just unfolded around him. I don't think he very, he very planned anything particularly. Mm -hmm. I think things just happened and he was in that state where things would just manifest around him the way they were meant to. Mm -hmm. Very simple. So what, what do you mean when, when you say that you don't think he was uh, <coughs> an individual, or what, what, what is that? What well, I think, he, I think he, um, I think he, what do I mean by that? Um, How did that manifest? I mean, yeah. I mean, to, to people talk about an egoless state, don't they? But I think that's a lot, kind of, can be misunderstood sometimes. So. But so I don't think <coughs> he had really any expectations of how <coughs> you know each each moment would unfold. I think he was so much in the moment okay. that he wasn't actually thinking or making any kind of plan whatsoever. He was just able to be in the moment completely. Yeah. And being around him, you were also drawn into just being in that moment where everything would unfold in this simply extraordinary way. Mm -hmm. um, extraordinary and yet completely ordinary. Mm. So that was the experience of being around Prakashananda, was that the ordinary became extraordinary and the extraordinary became ordinary. Mm. Well, that's... There was a lot of silence. There was a, there was a lot of silence sitting with him. And or he you'd just be, be quiet. He or would be, or we would all be quiet. We'd all be quiet. Do you mean it's like a sense of... There was no need was to it? speak. Okay. There was absolutely no need to speak. Mm -hmm. It was all, it was said, but there was no need to speak in any way. That was the, it was just the language of the heart. Mm. And he would often just sit and just stare into space for hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hours. A completely self-contained, no problem. People coming, people going, it was fine. And it, he was indeed, like, there was a feeling that he was, like, so in the present moment. And all, as, as you were saying, all the little ordinary things would become, I found that time slowed down. And, I, and it felt like he did things in a very slow, <laughs> conscious way. And I, I really have a strong memory of him. Um, with his tobacco box. He had a box of tobacco and I I just yeah. remember it. the way he would open it and the way he would, you know, press his thumb. There was just this real sense that there was there was That's no there was. mind. There was no mind there was nothing thinking uh -huh. about anything. There was just this uh. thumb <laughs> and then putting it in his mouth and then looking into space again. <laughs> And it was, it was just so lovely to sit with him. <laughs> it was so lovely to sit with him. Everyone around him would go into this quiet. Mm. Or they'd ask questions. And if someone asked a question, it was fine. He would talk so, to them and relate to them. Yeah. I didn't understand most of it because it was in Hindi, so it didn't matter. But if nobody asked a question, he didn't ask a question. He had, there was no necessity to speak. Mm whatsoever and um, uh, you know for me I remember sitting for hours with him in silence sometimes it was just you and me together in the room with him sitting in silence for hours it was completely <laughs> normal to arrive and sit down and not say a thing uh -huh. I remember on one <laughs> so occasion just sit and um, hang out. Hmm. I remember on one occasion he had he had um, we he was living at that time in this little room in, in, in Nasik hmm. very tiny little room it was about 12 by 12 and his and um, and his actual room, his bedroom, was this tiny little room, just off that, mm -hmm. uh, off this main room. And I remember once I went into his into his, he was in his in his uh, 
in his bedroom and he was about to go off somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he was packing a bag and he was sitting cross. I went in the, into his room, he called me, I went into his room and he was sitting in front of this this cupboard, and the cupboard was open, it was one of these metal kind of cupboards that the Indians kind of like, and, and he had just, his whole possessions were in this little cupboard, and it was like, I mean, there was just a few lungis and a sweater, and, and yet, you know, it was like the wealth of the universe was kind of there, and he was just sitting there in this state of absolute, I don't know, how can you say, he was like he was full to the brim mm. with with what I don't know with the, with the present moment you could say and and this cupboard door was open and all his and there was complete transparency there that was his possessions in this in this metal um, cupboard and he kind of looked around and he kind of and I I just took it in at a glance and I just it was like the universe was wide open he turned around he smiled and he just completely got what I experienced when I looked at this cupboard. He kind of got it! <laughs> and he just smiled, you know, as if the whole thing was really a huge joke. And um, it's funny, there's, there were so many, so many moments mm. like that, when you kind of, you know, when you entered into the moment, you invited into the moment with him. Mm. And it was this amazing thing of being in the moment with someone like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember I have another memory of um, after everyone went in the evening, um, he would lie down on the floor and one head would be cupped against his hand and he'd be kind of looking out, looking out the door and, um, and this would be the evening, the evening light would so it'd be getting darker. Mm. And he had the BBC, he used to listen to the BBC, he didn't speak English but he just he used to listen to the BBC and I remember this news came through, it was 1982 or 81, and the news came through about John Lennon. Oh. And he, he sort of turned around and he said, who's John Lennon? Wow. Right. And I said, I didn't know what to say to him. I said, well, John Lennon, is, he, he's, you know, he's this very famous musician, Babaji. I said, oh, right. And it was less like being in the moment with this news about John Lennon, this kind of awful news. And yet, because of being, you know, in India with this man, looking out the window in the evening, and getting this news, the whole thing was in a completely different, different perspective. Mm -hmm. And like, it was, it was most, uh, I mean, lots of, lots of things happened like that. Mm. And they're all kind of based on this sharing of him in the present moment, I would say. Mm. <coughs> but he also was very full of love. It wasn't just yeah uh, here now. So was there a sense of sitting with him that you didn't really need to go anywhere else? It was kind of like mm. coming home. That was absolutely sort of everything. There was no really questions to ask. There was, was no yeah. for me. There was no yeah. questions mm -hmm. to ask. Um, it was it was enough. It was the heart just was exploding open yeah and there yeah. was no nothing to say about it yeah because often when people talk about mm -hmm. like you know being in the now and all mindfulness things and all this it often feels quite a, kind of like an effort doesn't it oh no and i think it's a very different thing to when you this was not an i mean you know this, this was this was on a different level really mm. yeah there was a grace around him there was a grace and it seemed that everyone who walked into that room got taken in that grace into a different state mm. and it, and the, the different mixture of people that would be in that room from the wealthy businessman to the Christian nun to the local beggar to the Muslim sweet uh, seller to the child even a dog used to come and stay visit <laughs> and everyone would kind of go into this really mellow space. Because this was someone <laughs> who was, he was not in duality, he was outside yeah. of duality. He kind of transcended duality, so in the sense that everyone who came were kind of yeah. a part of the one. So it sounds like he was exuding that mm. from his very being, as a whole being was exuding yeah. that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely.
And so, you know, in a country where there's so many class restrictions and all of that, it, it just all it was abolished in his company. Yeah. So you could have everyone in the room with him all at once, from all different situations in life. Because I'm quite intrigued about when you, when you talked about grace and things. Yeah. You know, there's something I feel a lot yeah. is, is grace. Const yeah, constantly, it's mm -hmm. like amazing. So, and why, why and I, I'm, and it's a big mystery for me, right? Well, where, where does that come from? Why would it be embodied in someone like that? You know what I mean? Why, why, do, why do certain mm -hmm. people seem to draw that in around them? You know? It must so be the state that he's in. Well, I guess, you know, because that, that we are living, I guess, ultimately in the, in the in the Garden of Eden, you know, we are in this sort of extraordinary, exploding center of consciousness. This is just, this, this is the Big Bang has never stopped. It started, you know, it just uh -huh. goes on and on and on and on, and we're just in the middle of this Big Bang of consciousness. So some beings are more in tune with that. Yeah, I think that's And they right. attract it more Absolutely. around Absolutely. I don't field. think anyone has inherently got more grace than anyone else. I mean, grace no. is there. It's, it's always, had, it's always it? there. Mm. Always available. Mm. Always available. Well, I think it, that yeah. being in his company reminded us all of our own inherent state. Mm -hmm. That's what was so wonderful. Mm. It wasn't like, oh, I'm in a state that mm. I've never been in mm. and this is foreign. It's like, oh, mm. oh, this is really my true state. Yeah. But, it, but it was all completely beyond the mind. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the pre-verbal state. Mm. <laughs> and Titus, you, so you experience a similar thing with in the Christian tradition, don't you? Would you say? Yeah, is it different? yeah. How well, can you say it? is it different? I think, to a large extent, it is. The, it is the same thing. Um, but there must be a quality that you get from, yes. from the Christian tradition that I you think, weren't getting with him. Would I you say? think with the. I think with the. I mean, Prakashananda and Muktananda. Um, this was the path of, as I understood, it was the path of the, of the ascending Kundalini. Mm -hmm. So the. the it's the path of the Shakti, where the Shakti purifies the you know, six chakras, and finally yeah. get, there's a merging up in the Sahasra. And uh, and did Prakashananda used to talk about that? He did. He did talk okay. about that, uh -huh. but not the same way Baba Muktananda, you know, did. Bab ba Babaji was not really that. He wasn't a yogi in the same way as Baba Muktananda, and yet right. he was familiar with all that. And he used to talk about Saptashrim, the place where he lived, as being Saptashrim, the seven peaks, the seven cha the seven chakras. Oh, okay. And um, hmm. so, you know, in the sense that he was, he was a yogi. He was someone who the, you know, the Shakti purified the six, you know, the six centers and all that. With Christ, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a descending, it's a descending grace. And so I experience, um, I guess, the reason I was so entranced by Christ, when I when I, I met Christ and had a sort of meeting with Christ, if you like, when 1985, I came back from India and I went to these monasteries and I had this kind of meeting with Christ and mm -hmm. and I sort of sensed that um, because of the cosmic sacrifice of Christ, that this meant that anyone, you didn't, in a sense, if you were a devotee of Christ, you didn't really need to do all the endless sadhanas and mantras and tantras that somehow if you just hang on to the hem of the garment he would take you with him mm -hmm. to what is called the kingdom in other words that which transcends all phenomenon mm -hmm. that was the kingdom of heaven and that by being his devotee you didn't actually all you needed really was faith in Christ that was enough you didn't go through have to go through the endless sort of purifications of kundalini etc but of course the, the negative side of that is that most Christian people don't, because when you get the unfolding of the Kundalini, you get extraordinary ex sort of understanding on a sort of cosmic level, and you see how everything fits together. You kind of see how the cosmic dots all join mm. to some degree. Whereas in the Christian tradition, you don't really get that. It's much more like hard work, mm -hmm. because you're kind of expected to believe on, f you know, it's like a faith thing. Which works, so you can. But a lot of, a lot of mystic Christian mystics have talked about things like raptures. They, they do, which yeah, absolutely. Sound similar. It is these kind of revelations. It is. Tune in it is. It is. So like it's there, but that. somehow it it comes from a different place. The Kundalini comes from within, whereas you know the the, the Christian grace seems to come from without. It's almost as if 
Christ, Christ's kingdom sort of is right there, available, fully unfolded on some level outside of the cosmos, and it's something that sort of flows in, and you feel it kind of in in this kind of area. <coughs> That's what it is for me. I mean, okay. so you know, I can't say more than that. Really. Mm. Have you got a picture of percussion under somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's quite, that's close enough, yeah. <laughs> that's Babaji, Rashananda. <laughs> <laughs> nice, it's a lovely picture. <laughs> that was in the car for a long time. 